everyone to our our Zoom church meeting here in the Monterey Peninsula Seventh Day Adventist Church, and we welcome everyone. We're sorry that we can't meet in person, but we're happy that we can at least share this meeting on Zoom. I hope all of you are well and and happy in your environment, although it presents great difficulties to us. And and uh, as you know, uh, we're sequestered now. The rate of coronavirus infections is skyrocketing, and many of us uh, have personal uh, acquaintance with that problem in our families, and some of us are suffering financially as well as physically, and we just want to let you know we're praying for you and thinking about you every day, and we're so sorry that we can't meet in person. It's a good time for reflection and meditation and some special time for reading that uh, I've been doing been through Desire of Ages now and working on The Great Controversy, which I haven't read in a long time, and uh, trying to study the Bible as much as I can as well. So God bless you as we go into this service. Now we have the announcements, uh, and uh, you should be seeing these as they come up. Uh, there's an invitation to worship with us every Sabbath. Uh, from 9.45 when we begin the, begin the Sabbath school and then go into the church service. And uh, you can get the, uh, the Zoom message by emailing the pastor if you don't have it uh, for the Sabbath school and church service. Sabbath school meets at 9.45 in the morning and uh, uh, you can get a Zoom invitation for the Sabbath school if you mail Gary at homesickforheaven.com and uh, send him an email, and he'll send you a Zoom invitation. The Youth Sabbath School also meets at 9.50. Uh, you can email uh, bpantic at cccsda.org if, uh, if you don't have an invitation for that meeting. And, uh, and that also is ongoing at the same time that Adult Sabbath School is ongoing. And there's a new study topic, uh, What We Believe for Teens, by Seth J. Pierce, as you can see. There's going to be a special communion service uh, during the church service on Sabbath 1219 on Zoom. And uh, the plan is to uh, have your foot washing service at home uh, before this event happens and then uh, to get the, uh, the articles, the wine and the bread, uh, the grape juice and the crackers, uh, and have them ready for the service, uh, which will be conducted by Zoom. Again, if you don't have an invitation, uh, email the pastor. Uh, and he'll send you a Zoom invitation. There's a letter which everyone should have gotten as a church member uh, from Don Kellogg, our church finance committee chairman. And uh, it's a detailed letter about the church finances and uh, answers a number of questions you might have about how to uh, give money to the endowment fund. Uh, you can establish a donor advised fund through various financial institutions. There's advice about how to do that. Uh, there's another important uh, notification about people who have significant financial stress uh, in, our, in our church community. And so uh, members can contribute monies on a tax deductible basis to help other church members in need. Explain to you how you can do that, donate it to the deacons fund and notify the pastor for whom the money is uh, intended. And there's also uh, uh, explanation of how you can contribute monies uh, to help uh, students meeting their secondary and higher educational expenses. And uh, there's criteria for, uh, for donating this money to worthy students, and you can read about that in the letter as well. And then the estate planning guidelines are also in here. So it's a very detailed letter, and I'd encourage you to read it. If you haven't gotten this letter or somehow you've missed it on your emails, uh, please email the pastor, and he'll send you a copy of it. There's the online Bible studies that are ongoing. Uh, you can get involved with these uh, as well. And uh, you can register on the church website and email for that. If you have any questions about any of these things, you can uh, call the church at 831-393-5704 and uh, your call will be answered. The church is in need of finances where uh, we looked at our finances for the last financial meeting and we're about $40,000 behind this year in tithes and uh, church expenses, I think specifically in church expenses. And so we really uh, 
need you to consider giving to the church expenses. You can do this online, or you can mail the uh, donation to 375 Lighthouse Avenue, Pacific Grove, 93950. And the prayer meeting continues on Mondays and Thursdays at 7. Uh, you can call the church number, 831-393-5704, if you want to become involved in this uh, Zoom meeting, or email bpantic at cccsda.org. Uh, if you need any help at all, if you are, if you need prayer, if you need special visitation, uh, you can email the pastor Gary at homesickforheaven.com, or call the number eight three one three seven two seven eight one eight, and uh, you'll get a response. Make me a captive. Scripture reading today is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 11, verses 9 to 13. This is reading from the, King, from the New King James Version, or for the King James Version. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it will, shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Amen. So let's bow our heads for prayer. Our dear, kind Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being with us during this terrible pandemic and protecting us and sustaining us in this terrible time that we're living through our history and being with our families. And Heavenly Father, we ask your special blessing on those that are afflicted with this terrible virus, either financially or spiritually or physically, and please protect them and help them. And now that a vaccine is available on the horizon, please be with our leaders to help it to get distributed and, and given to all those in need that we all might be protected from this terrible pandemic. During this time, we especially need your Holy Spirit to work within our hearts, Heavenly Father. We, we're lonely, many of us, and we're sequestered in our homes, and we're so happy that we can pray to you and think about you and 
realize that you're with us at our extended family members who we can't see, but we can only talk to. And please be with them also. Be with the family members of every person that's within the hearing of my voice, that they also could be protected. But more than that, Heavenly Father, we need your guiding spirit in our lives to strengthen us. And we know that a time of trouble is coming at some point, and we want to have your spirit then too, but now especially, so that we can be strong and have fortitude and strength and to, to combat all the forces against us and in this world today. And keep us safe in your hands. We thank you for the Jesus' blood who died for us and who sacrificed his life for us on the cross. And we thank you for his intervention. And we know that when we're gathered, even by Zoom, that, that he is among our midst also, as he promised us, where two or three are gathered together in your name, there will I be also. And so we believe that. And we reach out to you by faith that you can come into our hearts and change us and make us more like you and convert us to work in your program and strengthen us to do your will in our lives. We ask all these requests and with the thanksgiving of your presence in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. We're glad you're able to tune in our church service today. Today I want to talk about what's next. We've all been dealing with the coronavirus for a long time now. It seems like forever. It's the new norm, and there's many different aspects of it. But that may not be the last thing that happens. What's next? We'll talk about that today. In the tenements of New York City, in the late 19th and earliest, early 20th century, the apartments were built with bedrooms one on top of another. It was common to hear your upstairs neighbor take off a shoe, drop it, then repeat the action. It became a shorthand for waiting for something you knew was coming. What's next? What's the other shoe to drop? So... Let's talk for a moment about that. In part, or what part, if any, does the coronavirus play in God's overall plan for Christ's return? I asked that question back in March when we started the coronavirus. What part does it play? Is it a signpost about the second coming? Before coronavirus, we might not have thought about issues like sheltering in place. You know, it's only as you go through certain things that it kind of becomes part of your conscious and you look up, oh, is that really mentioned in the Bible? I spent a whole couple of weeks a long time ago talking about sheltering in place. The first example that I gave is in the ark. And I remember when we first talked about sheltering in place and they're writing in the ark, they did not know how long they would be in the ark, and it turned out to be five months. Well, for us, it's been a long time. It seemed like forever. That's the first example. Just before they were to come to the new world, after the flood, they had to shelter in place, and God protected them. Writing in the ark was the first biblical example. The second biblical example, of course, is the verse in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 20 and 21, where it says, Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and will no more cover her slain. So there's a definite reference to sheltering in place. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment just before Jesus comes in the second coming. A reference there in Isaiah. That's the second reference to sheltering in place. The third one, I sent out a greeting or an email message to the church this week about the ninth plague when the plagues were falling in Egypt. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, 
that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, darkness, darkness which may even be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. Nor they did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days, sheltering in place. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. You know, if you've ever been confined by outside circumstances, I had that happen to me when I was 16. I had my driver's license and I was in my car and I was going down to Huntington Beach and the fog rolled in off the ocean while I was just slowly cruising along the highway that was right on the edge of the beach. And the fog came in so thick, you couldn't see the front of the car. And I stopped in the middle of the road, and I thought, man, I'm in trouble here. I can't sit in the middle of the road. And there was no shoulder to pull off on because it just kind of dropped off onto the beach on one side. I remember seeing it before the fog rolled in. And so I'm sitting in my car. I'm 16 years old, and I'm thinking, man, how do I get out of this? I can't just sit here. Someone's going to plow into me. But how do you go forward when you can't see? You don't know what's next. You don't know what's ahead. I ended up opening my car door and looking down at the white line on the road. I thought, well, here's something to help me. I'll just kind of creep along slow. And I just started going slowly. I could have run into somebody else that was stopped, but there was no one there. And I did that for a while, watching that white line until the fog broke. And then I hit the gas and said, I'm getting out of here. The Bible says they did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. Sheltering in place. The third example in the Bible. The fourth one, of course, is the tenth and final plague, the Passover. Moses called for the elders of Israel and said to them, Pick out and take lambs for yourselves according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. You shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of his door of his house until morning, sheltering in place. Now, we might not have even thought about those kinds of things before the coronavirus. It wasn't something that was commonly talked about. It wasn't something that we discussed and said, oh, we're going to do this. Before the coronavirus, we might not have thought about the isolation from social distancing, wearing a mask, and lack of interaction. Boy, has that hit home. The statistics for suicides, the statistics for depression, for all kinds of abuse and trauma, different things have skyrocketed because of that. People need to get out and interact. In the ninth plague, of course, it talks about isolation. Darkness was so thick for three days, they didn't see one another. They were kind of isolated. Now, that was a shorter period of time, but it's a biblical example of that. Thirdly, something we might not have thought a lot about before this coronavirus, some will not be able to buy or sell except with special government approval. Boy, if you watch the news, people are suing their state legislatures and governments. In one state, they're actually trying to impeach the leader of their state because they want to get rid of the dictators that are telling them you can't have more than 10 people or two people or five people at your thanksgiving dinner they're tired of the controls of locking things down they had one man that ran a a bar and he said we've complied we all bought plastic we're doing this we're wiping the counters down and now they're telling us we can't have any indoor dining no outdoor dining we're going to go under Well, you ask a lot of different businesses, small business owners, about being able to buy or sell. Now, the biblical example, the concept is in the Bible that you won't be able to buy or sell except with government approval. The concept is there. It's for a different reason. I understand that. 
Prophecy talks about that in Revelation 13, verse 16 and 17. Unless you have the mark of the beast or worship the false image that's set up, you might not buy or sell except one that has that mark or worshiping the image of the beast, that false image. We all know about that prophecy. But the concept is there about government control and that's being felt. Fourthly, there's a lot of talk now, and the Supreme Court has ruled on this recently with one of these cases, worked its way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said you cannot take away the constitutional rights of individuals for worshiping and all the different things just because there's a health crisis. Well, those are issues the Bible prophesied about and said all this will happen. Whether or not you believe these current pandemic issues relate to the second coming or not, how would you know? How would you know if they really relate to the second coming or if this is just another thing to come down the line like the Spanish flu or one of these other issues that comes every 100 years or 150 years and they have this pandemic going on? How would you know if it related to the Bible? Well, if you were like Jesus, and we all want to be like Jesus, but if you were like Jesus, the Bible says, for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Holy Spirit was given without measure, according to John chapter 3, verse 34. You see, the Holy Spirit is promised to tell us things to come. And Jesus had a lot of insights about things to come and insights into people. John 16, 13 says, However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whether... Whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. That's one of the blessings of the Holy Spirit. Well, maybe if you're not quite like Jesus yet, many of us are working, and that's a goal in our life, but we're not there yet where the Holy Spirit is poured out without measure to us in our life. If you are a prophet of God, the Bible talks about, it says in Amos chapter 3, verse 7, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophet. Well, if you were a prophet, then God reveals it to you and you could share it with the people. How would you know if the coronavirus and all these different issues that we've just talked about actually relate to something that's predicted in the Bible? How would you know? Well, if you're listening to a biblical preacher, you might know. The Bible talks about that. Actually, our Bible worker, Bogdan, talked about that, about people's feet. He had a whole sermon on that. And then here's the verse that he quoted in Romans chapter 10, verse 14 to 17. How then shall they call upon him whom they have not believed? How shall they then believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they are sent? It is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? That's actually in Isaiah chapter 53, I believe. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if you're listening to a biblical preacher and you're kind of tuned in somewhere, and there's a lot of different choices for people to tune in anymore. Well, the Bible says the time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. They will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Well, now more than ever. The church is not only empty because no one's here from the coronavirus, but the church website sometimes 
we check on how many people are listening and tuning into the service, and there's not that many because they're going someplace else where they want to hear something different, a different message, and it's easy to do that. But some will not want to hear truth at the end of time, and they may be listening to someone that might take them astray. The Old Testament prophets talked about that, that there might be biblical preachers that were leading Israel astray in the Old Testament. It says in Ezekiel 13, verse 22 and 23, because with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, you have strengthened the hands of the wicked so that he does not turn from his wicked way to save his life. Therefore, you shall no longer envision futility nor practice divination. For I will deliver my people out of your hand and you shall know that I am the Lord. So there were false preachers according to the Old Testament. In Ezekiel 13, verse 6 to 8, it says they have envisioned futility and false divination saying, Thus saith the Lord, but the Lord has not sent them. Yet they hope that the word may be confirmed. Have you not seen a futile vision? Have you not spoken false divination? You say the Lord says, but I have not spoken. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you have spoken nonsense and envisioned lies, therefore I am indeed against you, says the Lord God. So we have to be careful who we listen to. Even the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians, it talks about false teachers appearing at the end of time. It says, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. So according to the Bible, there will be false teachers that infiltrate the church at the end of time. So I ask the question again, how would you know if all these things are precursors or signs of the second coming? Well, fourthly, if you're familiar with the scriptures yourself, if you're personally studying God's word and you have a Bible study planned that you go through on your own. Now, nobody's in church every week in the sense of meeting together and fellowshipping, maybe encouraging each other. Maybe members are calling each other and praying with each other on the phone. I don't know that. But if you're personally familiar with what the Bible says because you're listening to, you're studying, you're memorizing verses, the Bible says your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God wants to enlighten us, but as we fill our hearts and minds with his word and we see conditions happen around us we say well wait a minute that kind of fits what the bible says over here in this story or that story and we begin to connect the dots and the holy spirit guides us that's why we're counseled in second timothy 2 15 it says study to show thyself approved unto god a workman that need not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth now, that doesn't mean pastor or Bible worker study to show yourself approved. It means everyone open your Bible and study to see if that's what it says in the Bible, if that's what's really predicted in the Bible. In Acts 17, verse 11, it is a verse that complements one group of people over another group, and it says these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. There might be a lot of predictions going on, but how would you know if you don't study for yourself? So what part 
if any, does the coronavirus play in God's overall plan for Christ's return? How would you know if you don't study his word? Have a plan for yourself, not the pastor's plan for you or the Bible worker's plan for you, but your own connection to God. How would you know? So when we think about the coronavirus and the lockdowns and the no buying or selling and all these kind of restrictions with the mask and the social isolation, and we ask, what's next? Is that the last thing that's going to come up before the second coming of Jesus, before he appears? I don't think so. So what's next? What can we know for sure? What can we learn from thinking about what's next? Well, first of all, we've said many times in sermons and messages from our pulpit, God knows the future. Two weeks ago, we talked about that. In Daniel chapter 2, there's that vision. And then we quoted Isaiah chapter 42, Isaiah chapter 46. These things I tell you before they come to pass. I tell you of them. God will do what he wants to do. And he was able to predict the future of governments that are coming. And we went through that. And we're all familiar with Daniel chapter 2. Secondly, there's going to be things we go through that we don't understand while we're going through them. And we don't understand why they happened to us. Why did this happen to happen to me or my family, my loved ones. Why did this happen to me? Well, are there biblical examples of that in the Bible? In John chapter 1, I think it's verse 10. It says, His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him, and that they had done these things to him. I think the reference is wrong. It's not John 1.10. His disciples did not understand these things. I've miscopied the reference because I know what John 1.10 says. I don't think that's what it is. But anyway, it's a quote from the Bible. It's about the triumphal entry of Jesus. And they didn't understand. You see, they shouted they want him to assume the throne and overthrow the Romans And so they didn't understand according to the Bible. So when they went through them, they didn't understand what was going on. In John 13, verse 7, notice another reference to the same kind of thing. Jesus answered and said to him, what I'm doing to you, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Sometimes we're not given the answer when we pass through difficult times and it's a puzzlement to us. It causes pain to us. When they did the communion service and Jesus knelt down and he began to wash their feet, you remember he came to Peter and Peter said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? He says, never. You're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, If I don't wash you, you have no part with me. And then Jesus gives this answer. What I'm doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. It may become clear afterwards. There's other biblical examples of that. When Jesus was resurrected, the church went through a change, a period of different things going on. We've been through a change with this coronavirus and we're wondering what's going on, what's next? Well, when they went through the resurrection where Jesus died on the cross and he was resurrected, they were all confused and they were looking for him in the wrong places. You remember that the ladies came to the tomb and they were looking for Jesus there and there were angels there that met them. And they said, he is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and the third day rise again. 
You know, as it turns out, if you study God's word, there's actually 11 different times that Jesus told the disciples, I will rise on the third day or by the third day or after three days. One of those phrases he used, 11 different references telling his disciples of what was going to come. And he said, I will meet you. And they forgot. And so the angel said, remember what he said? Oh, yeah, he did say that. I forgot. So there's many references and stories in the Bible that tell us sometimes when we're in the midst of something we're going through that's difficult, we don't remember how it fits and we don't have all the understanding we need to say, oh, now I see how that all came together and fit. When Jesus tells the parable of the ten virgins, five wise and five foolish, he tells this parable to emphasize how everyone should be ready. They should be storing up extra oil. That's the point of the parable. Yet, in the story, as Christ told it, all ten virgins fell asleep. Is it possible that somewhere along through the long, drawn-out coronavirus and all of the mundane that we're going through, we kind of fall asleep thinking, well, eh, I'm bearing up and uh, I don't know why this is happening and we kind of get confused well, the Bible says all ten fell asleep. If we stay familiar with God through his word, then we may gain special insights into current events. That's the importance of reading different stories. And you say, oh, wait a minute. Here's a verse that talks about something and God can speak to your heart. There's many times in my life where I didn't understand why I was going through something. I've told this story before when I was living in Riverside, California, Woodcrest. And I was praying, working on my deck out in my backyard in the sunshine. And I'm praying like mad about some ministry that I wanted to do. And I'm praying, saying, Lord, please tell me whether you want me to do this or not. And I had a, a neighbor that didn't like me very much. Seems like I'm plagued with that sometimes. I, I move into a place and there's a nasty neighbor on the right or on the left and it just seems to happen over and over in my life. But I don't know, I don't, maybe it's me, uh, whatever. But I had a neighbor that would cuss me out once a month. I like clockwork. He would come up to the fence and he would call me, Gary! And I, oh, not now, Kenny. And I was thinking, I'm really praying to God as I'm working on my deck and I'm asking God for an answer. And I say, Lord, let me know if that, part of ministry if I go into that kind of ministry if that's pleasing in your sight and I hear this guy next door Kenny and he says Gary Gary and I think not now Kenny I'm praying I'm working away praying and he keeps going and the guy's usually got a beer can in his hand a cigarette in his hand and he's cussing at me so I walk over to where he's at and my property is up higher than his property and every time I go over there I get my monthly cussing you know, he tells me what a louse I am and no good. He doesn't like me as a neighbor. Well, I walk over there this time. And Kenny says, I'm really sorry that I've been mean to you. And I've cussed you out from time to time. I really shouldn't have done that. You've really been a good neighbor. You fixed up your property and you haven't bothered me. He said, I heard you were an evangelist. And... I thought you were going to set up a tent in your front yard and put sawdust on the ground and hard start hold meetings and have cars come parking in and really ruin the neighborhood. But he says, you actually fixed up your house and you've raised the value of the properties around here and you really did nice and I was wrong and I'm sorry. And I mean, I'm flabbergasted. But as I turned and walked away from Kenny, okay, Kenny, thank you. And I turned and I walked away. Half of a Bible verse flashed through my mind. And it was in Proverbs. And the, the verse the flashed through my mind, it was half of the verse, said, God will even make his enemies be at peace with him. Well, I didn't know of any enemies that I had except Kenny next door. And I thought, well, that's a strange verse to flash through my mind. 
So I had to go in the house and I had to look it up. But it's in Proverbs. And it says, when a man's ways please the Lord, he will make even his enemies to be at peace with him. I was praying that God would share with me whether my way was pleasing to God about going into a certain ministry. And here he answered my prayer through Kenny. And I was saying, not now, Kenny. And that was the answer to my prayer. But I wouldn't have realized that if I didn't memorize that verse in the Bible and it came flashing back in my mind. So if we stay familiar with God through His Word, we may gain special insights into how God is leading us and current events. God wants to lead us. He wants to lead our church, yes. But He wants to lead each one of us individually through the valley of the shadow of death and bring us out on the other side. In John chapter 13, verse 19, Jesus makes this statement. I tell you this beforehand so that when it happens, you will believe that I am the Messiah. Think about that statement for a moment. Jesus was telling them what's coming. I'm telling you this so you'll know that when it happens, you'll remember what I said and you'll say, oh, yeah, God was aware of that. And he told me about it in advance. Now, the setting for that particular scripture is Judas' betrayal of Jesus. I tell you this beforehand so that when it happens, you will believe that I am the Messiah. But that phrase of Christ applies to many different things that he has shared with us in his word. What else can we learn from what we're going through and asking the question, well, what's next? We can ask for the Holy Spirit to be in our life and be praying for that. You know, God tells us that we should be praying for that and asking for the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 11, verse 9 and 13, it says these words, So I say to you, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask Him? Have you been praying for the Spirit to guide you day by day? to lead you and be in your life? If you do, the Holy Spirit will appear. And what happens when the Holy Spirit comes into your life in a special way, especially when you're locked down and you're isolated and you need reassurance from God that He cares about you? What happens when you pray for the Holy Spirit? We receive comfort in difficult times. Did He not tell the disciples, I will send you the Comforter? I won't leave you as orphans. We will receive comfort in difficult times. I think there's a lot of people that need comfort during these times. We're drawn closer to Jesus. Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit that would be poured out upon the disciples when change was coming and he was leaving. And he says he will not speak about himself but he will help you remember my words and draw you closer to Jesus. The Holy Spirit will reveal things to come. And we had that verse and we talked about the Holy Spirit will show you things to come. The Holy Spirit will give us understanding and insights and help us put things together. In Ephesians chapter 4, when people chase the Holy Spirit out of their life, it says they become beyond feeling and they're dull and slow of understanding. If we want understanding and insights, we have to invite the Holy Spirit to come in and give us those insights, those guidance, help us to collect the dots sometimes so we understand where we are and how God loves us the Holy Spirit will help us be in the right place at the right time. What a special experience that is. 
when you're in the right place at the right time. You know, I've had that happen in my life a couple different times where I think Philippe used to call them divine appointments where God puts you right there to speak a word of encouragement for someone that needs it. And I was praying that someone would come and witness to me today and you answered my prayer. The Holy Spirit can do that. And there's many examples in the Bible of that. The Bible told Ananias that I will send you Saul of Tarsus. And he told Saul of Tarsus, I will send you to Ananias because he'll be the one coming in. He helps us be in the right place at the right time. Philip was there with the Ethiopian eunuch. And then the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin so we can stay close to Jesus. Are you viewing this coronavirus event as a signpost that his coming is near? The whole world is infected and is being affected by this coronavirus. Jesus tells us, Blessed are those servants whom the Master, when he comes, will find watching. I know it's been a long time in our fellowship. We haven't had a lot of fellowship. We're going to plan a special service in two weeks from now when we have a Zoom church service. I know some of you have already told me you're looking forward to it. We hope to have all the parts of the church service with a children's story and special music and singing together over Zoom, of course, not here in our church yet, because we want to encourage each other. We're looking forward to that. We'll be sending out the invitation and posting it on a website so you can easily join in. We hope you'll join in two weeks when we have that. Jesus said, blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. In Matthew 5, 6, he says, blessed are those who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness, for they shall be filled. If you're hungry and you're thirsting, God will fill you to overflowing. The Bible says, when you see these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. We see many uncomfortable things beginning to happen and we don't have an answer to the question of what's next unless you're like Jesus and you have the Holy Spirit without measure, unless you're a prophet that God has revealed it to you. But if you study the Bible and you study His Word and you invite the Holy Spirit into your heart and your life each day, God can enlighten your mind and open your heart to help you put the pieces together about what's next and help you know that he will be there with you to comfort you. You know, the name of the Holy Spirit is paraclete. And paraclete means the one who stands beside you in battle. I know that many of you have been battling with health issues You've been battling with the isolation, finances, all kinds of different issues. And so when we ask what's next, coronavirus may not be the only thing on the horizon before Jesus appears. But if you walk with him and study and receive encouragement from him, you'll know that he'll be there with you. Let's pray together as we close. Father, we thank you for the assurance that you have given to us, that you tell us things in advance so we will know that your word is true, that you have the ability to see the future, and you're willing to help us get home safely. Lord, help us to be hungering for your presence, to be seeking your face, your word to draw closer to you by asking for the Holy Spirit to guide us, to encourage us during this dark period of time. We ask for your presence and your spirit to fall in abundance in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you. Amen. Make me a captive, Lord, and then I shall be free. Force me to render up my soul, and I shall
I stay.